Hello everyone, Karnasa here and welcome back to Coming Home Redux. In this episode, we are going to be industrializing Armstrong. We are also going to be sending a rescue mission over to Armstrong because I was a bit of a donut and left some kerbals over there that I really shouldn't have done. And at the very end, we're also going to be expanding production of fish and pellets at Collins Station. But what we're going to be doing at the very beginning is starting off in the vehicle assembly building. I mentioned in the last episode that I was having a bit of an issue with these material processing units. The fact that they were only working at 16.7% of their maximum efficiency. That's really bad. I was using these to produce all of the materials that I want for material kits and specialised parts. And yes, that, that really low rate really wasn't swimming well with me. It, it just didn't, didn't sink well. Or, uh, it, yeah, it wasn't great. Really, really wasn't great. So I did notice on the base that the USI Tundra parts that had the refinery on them, they can also produce the exact same materials that those processing units can as well. They were working about 300%. Much, much, much more to my liking. So what I did there was just design an entire new module that was basically built around those Tundra refinery modules because they are so much better, I might as well use them. I do have loads of engineers and technicians on the base, so we should be getting quite a high percentage. I've honestly got no idea what's going wrong there. Probably me balking something up with USI, I did check on all of the forums and tried to see what it could possibly be and nothing to my, to my knowledge. I don't know what was wrong, so... Hopefully with these new refinery modules, it will be a bit better. Although that being said, those material processing units are the only things that I have available that can turn ore into liquid fuel and oxidizer and monopropellant. So that is also kind of a bit of a, a bummer, if I'm going to be honest, because we are going to want to produce a lot of liquid fuel and oxidizer. And yes, now we're mining. And unfortunately, that little pop up there, I was a little bit silly yet again. I swear this entire episode is just me being completely stupid with setting these down. I thought we had rare metals in the Highlands. I was convinced we had rare metals in the Highlands, but apparently not. No, there were no rare metals there at all. So my original plan was to send down three of these capybara spider miners, as Jade of Mar did call them. I think it was capybara spider miners. Yes, I was only going to be sending down three of these, but unfortunately, because I sent one to a wrong location, which didn't have the resources that I actually needed, well, we're going to have to send four down, which is a, a little bit of a shame, but, I mean, they're not very expensive, and we can build them relatively easily at Collins Station, which is exactly what we're doing. We're just building them at that space station and then sending them down to the surface. The last one that we sent down, we did break off a solar panel, unfortunately, but... Well, it doesn't really matter because we've got that ginormous nuclear reactor on the end that will provide more than sufficient power to run these miners for years and years and years. I think I said in the last episode, it'll, they'll last about 30 years before they ever need refueling, which is great. The solar panels were there just, you know, for like a little bit of backup power in case the nuclear reactor had some sort of catastrophic meltdown and blew up the entirety of Armstrong. No, I, I don't think they're quite large enough to be able to do that, although Armstrong is a very small moon. So, so who knows? No, no, they're absolutely not. But it was nice just to have a little bit of a backup just in case. Anyway, we have got all of those miners down now on the surface. And I am just going through every single one of them, making sure that the resources that we are mining are going to Aldrin Base 1. And they all are. And we are gathering all of the materials that we could ever possibly want in order to produce a fully self-sufficient base on the surface of Armstrong. We've got all of the natural resources done now. Now we just need to work on the next part of the production chain, which is obviously taking those natural resources and turning them into something useful, like material kits, or specialized parts, or colony supplies, or there's, there's loads of different things that we could really build here. USI is, is as I've said before, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. Anyway, what we are doing now is sending down the refinery module that I did build in the vehicle assembly building at the beginning of this episode. So this is, yeah, it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just a refinery module. It also has a recycler on it too. And essentially what the recycler does is it takes recyclables, which are produced when you use machinery, and turns them into metals, polymers, and one of our chemicals. Yeah, it, you kind of get back the raw ingredients that you would from creating material kits. So at least we're able to get back a little bit of what we use. But 
We do need to connect this to Aldrin base. And I did get, is it Alexander Kerman? Yes, Alexander Kerman out. And I didn't know this about those flexor tubes. I mean, I've been using them enough. I really, I really should learn all about them by now. But if they are too close, the angle is obviously too great. Maybe, maybe I should have lowered one of them, but you can't connect them. So we did have to pick this module up again, fly it a little bit away, and then Alexander Kerman was able to successfully connect those two together, Aldrin Base and the new module that we just set down. One other thing that I added that I did not show in the build was a little box on top, a little box of surprises and secrets. It contained a mallet and some stakes. Yeah, so wh wh why would you send a mallet and some stakes over to a surface base on a far-flung moon? Well, they are going to be critically important for extra planetary launch pads. Yes, they are going to be our pad that we actually can build stuff from. So with that stake stuck down into the ground, we can now build stuff from there. Obviously, we do need specialized parts and material kits in order to do that, which is what we're working on right now we do have all of the natural resources that we could ever possibly want. So with the planetary logistics, I'm just going through all of those silos and making sure that planetary logistics is turned on all of them. Then that way we're going to suck those resources out of the planet and then we're going to put them into Aldrin base where we will start producing stuff. And we can see that we have produced a few specialized parts already. However, I am also trying to produce machinery at the same time. Machinery does use specialized parts, and when I make that machinery, well, unfortunately, we cannot create enough specialized parts to actually keep that going. And it's not the production process that is too slow. If we had the right amount of materials, there we go, we can see specialized parts and material kits are being produced. If we had the sufficient amount of materials to make specialized parts, we would produce more specialized parts than we could ever possibly want in order to sustain our machinery. The one thing that I'm missing is turning silicates into silicon. That's the, the big bottleneck at the moment. And that is because, once again, I was using one of those 3.75 meter material processing units. I don't know why I'm using those. They're really bad. I need to change them all up, except for LFO. But yes, we will be doing that. So unfortunately, we will have to send down yet another refinery in order to be able to produce enough silicon for what I want. But anyway, enough of the whole production focus aside now what we're going to be doing is launching a new variant of the manta and i mean it's a new variant it's just got a little bit different inside the cargo bay i did say that unfortunately due to a, a little bit of an oversight by me our crew down on nuke base one have run out of habitation time they are a little bit homesick and that means that they have turned to tourists so tourists cannot eva so in order to get these guys back home, what I am going to have to do is somehow dock to Nuke Base 1, which is definitely easier said than done. It is in the middle of the highlands. It's not very flat ground. And the only docking ports we do have are the flexor tubes, which actually is my savior in the end because flexor tubes, well, you can just get a Kerbal out and right click them together. So what I have done is I have come back to the breaking ground part. Yes, I seem to be enjoying these at the moment. I've, I've never really experimented that much with robotics. I did it a little bit in Kerbal Gets Real the next millennia, but I was using Infernal Robotics then, which I, I honestly do think is still better than the breaking ground parts, but that's beside the point. And yes, we got this rather weird contraption out, which had a, <laughs> had a flexor tube on top. And this way, I knew that I was able to connect the base to the Manta. Now, I'm not playing with connected life support or living, connected living space even. So that does mean that our Kerbals are somehow able to fit through this kind of tiny little hydraulic tube and get onto the Manta that way. Obviously, that's not really what happened. I like to think that, well, the Manta was parked five meters away from the base. Even if they've had a bit of a rough time, surely their vessel back home, they can see that right in front of them. They're like, I'll put my spacesuit on one final time. Fine, I'll do it. I'll get on board the Manta. Then I can go back, go back home, see me dogs or, or cats or, or whatever. Do, do Kerbals keep pets? That's a question. Do Kerbals have pets? Do they have like little green lizards that run around following them or? I don't know. I've never really, <laughs> I've never considered that. But yes, no, they're going to go back, they're going to get all their comforts at home and everything should be good. At least that's that's the way I saw it. And that that kind of like weird gimmicky 
flexitube on the stick kind of trick that I pulled there was just a little push that those kerbals needed in order to actually get back home. Anyway, enough of that. What we're doing now is expanding fission pellet production. So the one at Nuke Base 1, the Whirlyjig nuclear reprocessor, was incredibly bad. It could only fill up the actual part and it had a capacity of 320 enriched uranium. Terrible. And I also had to wait for it to cool down before transferring it. It just took a really long time. And to create that 320 enriched uranium, I think it took about 30 days. So it was a very slow process as well. We're now using a new nuclear reprocessor from Tundra. I, I swear the Tundra parts are just magical compared to <laughs> the other parts. That can produce about 320 enriched uranium in maybe three hours. It is light speeds faster than what we were using before, which is just absolutely fantastic. And another great benefit of that is that it will store that enriched uranium anywhere on the vessel that has capacity to store it. So I don't have to babysit it anymore. I don't have to sit around the base waiting for this all to be produced, which is absolutely fantastic. And we did send down a new transport device to actually get that enriched uranium up. And because of that, well, yeah, we needed a space on Collins Station. And the old one, I kind of forgot to put any fuel in it before undocking it. Like a bit of a moron. Yes, no, that was not one of my finer moments. But with a little bit of help from Collins Station, we bonked it away. And we did leave us a free spot to dock this new one. Absolutely full of enriched uranium, which, as I've mentioned before, we are going to be turning this into fission pellets. And this is going to be really nice, the fact that I have a fast way of doing this now, because I do have two vessels that we are going to be constructing in a future episode. They are going to be two new EVE-class vessels, except they contain more fission pellets than the first one, the RSSA, RSAS EVE. Yes, they contain double the amount of fission pellets, so it is going to take a while longer to actually fuel them up. So with this new system, it's going to be great. But those two new vessels, I will announce the name for those in the next episode. Until then, I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.